Nice to see you all again. I'm, I'm going to try today to use the new technology, so I hope, <laughs> I hope that I have uh, a forgiving audience and uh, <laughs> that you will uh, understand some of the issues which uh, present themselves to us when we try to do this kind of thing. I'm going to talk today about uh, Buddhism and particularly as it relates to Japan, and uh, I will attempt to use some of this material to try to show you some of my ideas about it. I'm not a Japanese specialist. Uh, I certainly have tried to keep up with a bit of what goes on with it. I have my own ideas about Buddhism in Japan. They're not always shared by everybody else, so uh, you're welcome to agree or disagree as we go along today. I'd like just to talk briefly about my view of how uh, Buddhism comes to, um, to Japan. And um, we, of course, see Buddhism as it starts out here in the, in the Ganges Valley. And we know about all of the problems it had to get across this, this enormous mastiff of mountains, uh, and even trying to go around it and coming across into the Taklamakan Desert to circle the desert because it's such a big problem to make its way down through the corridor into the Han people's uh, region. Uh, as Buddhism did this, uh, it was moving toward uh, Japan. And so what we are looking at when we look at the, the ways in which Buddhism made its way across these areas is to ask the question of what kind of Buddhism finally did arrive in Japan. When you look at, uh, at the, this satellite map, I think that you can understand why we, we firmly believe that Buddhism in Japan came from Korea. That is, that it came from the Pekshe Kingdom located here. Now, of course, Pekshe Kingdom faces over toward the Shandong Peninsula of China, but we also know that across these regions in the north, the areas of land which touched the Korean peoples that at the time when Buddhism was being introduced, these were all being ruled by Turkic-speaking kingdoms and also by Mongol-speaking people. And because of that, uh, the type of Buddhism which went to the Pekshe dynasty, in my view, was a form of Buddhism that was not Chinese in the sense of being Han. It was Turkic. And from there, uh, it makes its way over to, to Japan. And uh, that process of going over to Japan is also something which we look at in terms of that the movement goes into the southern part of Japan, into the Shimani area, and then up to the central part of the Japanese kingdom that's emerging. So I just show you this so that you get some feeling. I, I am going to take one little thing here to say. Part of what I'm showing you today comes from a new project of mine, which is called the Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative. There are about, uh, this is a little ad. <laughs> You're used to that, right? Uh, and um, I'd also like to thank Howie Land, who's here this morning, who's been my technical advisor through all of this, and Howie's here to make sure I don't make too many mistakes this morning. Um, I'd like to just show you, though, what I'm aiming for with this, just for fun. Um, I'm going to outline China, and I'm going to put in, I'm going to take off the satellite map, and I'm just going to show you a map of China. And just for example, I'm going to put in uh, all the Chinese heritage sites that we're working with, including the Great Long Wall. Now, when I put it up like this, you look at it on a map, you just see a bunch of dots, right? But if I put back on the satellite map, we begin to see that the Chinese heritage sites are in the mountains. Everywhere the altitude goes up, you're going to have a heritage site. Doesn't say that there's a causal relation, but this is an idea that we have that eventually I would like to be able to come sometime and show you for Japan as well as Korea 
that when we begin to put down cultural maps against each other, we have an, an understanding of the situation that we cannot have otherwise. In other words, this teaches a great deal, just these two maps together, teaches us a great deal about the way in which Buddhism and other things were being developed at that Shangdung Peninsula facing Korea, which finally led it over to Japan. And it tells us that there was uh, an enormous interest in, in mountains. Uh, let's see. So now I'll take you to my presentation basically on the Japanese situation. So, trying to do this right. <laughs> My Howie tells me that my computer is is too old and too. <laughs> I understand that, but my wife doesn't. <laughs> you know, honey, I need a new computer. <laughs> I'm just basically for for this. I'm just showing some slides. I've scanned them into my computer so that I don't have to always go searching through stacks and stacks of slides. It's just a way to help me. When we look at pre-Buddhist Japan, what we see is uh, cultural patterns which are distinctly different from those that developed after the coming of Buddhism and its contact with the continent. When we look at these prehistoric uh, potteries, we can understand that they represent a, a, a kind of development which we little understand at this point. That is, the Yayoi and Jomon cultures of Japan are very little studied still. This has a historical and political reason, of course, and that is that the Japanese government would not allow there to be the study of the prehistoric Japan during and after the Meiji Reformation because it came in direct conflict with some of the government's positions with regard to the divinity of the emperor. Because of that, we are still struggling to understand all of the factors that made up the Japanese culture. DNA studies are beginning to help. It's very interesting. The Japanese have become extremely involved in doing DNA studies for looking for people who have the Yayoi spike and the Jomon spike in their DNA. And that they have certain health problems and other issues which also seem to be related to these DNA spikes something the health industry in Japan is beginning to work with. We believe now that part of the influence that came into Japan was what we now call Austronesian. Austronesian is the new word for the cultural pattern, which is a linguistic cultural pattern that stretches from Hawaii to Madagascar. Uh, it reached Hawaii along about 800 uh, common era, and it reached Madagascar about 750 it reached New Zealand at about the same time. This uh, Austronesian cultural pattern that's now being studied seems to have gone north along the islands. It's only practiced by island people. They don't go inland. So it's not uh, equivalent to the uh, aborigines of Australia. They don't belong to this pattern. Uh, and But part of Japan's the Jomon culture seems to have been related to this Austronesian. All of these are things that we need to explore in order to understand a bit better what Japan was like when the continental Buddhist and other materials came to it. One of the things that Buddhism did for Japan was to cause it to define its own religion. Because, as we all know, to have a stranger come automatically makes you think about yourself and other. <laughs> you define yourself by that. I, I suppose every older child has probably had this experience in their real life, that is when the new baby comes, all of a sudden they have to redefine themselves because there's another there that wasn't there before. If there's no other, it's really hard to define yourself because there's no there's not, nothing for you to see as a boundary between yourself and something else. So Japan had never given a name to its religious tradition before Buddhism came along. 
It was only after Buddhism came that it decided it had to call it something, and it called it Shinto, the way of the gods. But that idea of something and calling it something is an abstraction. When we abstract, that is, when we, we take something which we're just living and we give it a name and we abstract it in that form, that's an enormous cultural shift. If Buddhism did nothing else than cause Japan to define its own religion, it had affected the Japanese enormously. The early forms of Shinto were probably were built around, of course, here the Tori. It was built, it was a very sim simple kind of institutional structure. There were not lots of buildings and this sort of campus-like involvement. Buddhism helped them to define themselves and also to develop themselves into a much more institutional uh, uh, group. And so the Tories, I think, began to represent the influence from the continent and the influence of Buddhism. We even see it not only in the way they named themselves, but in the way they began to present themselves to the world. So that was a big contribution of Buddhism to, to the Japanese environment. The other thing was that Buddhism brought to, to Japan new technology. I'm joking this morning about new technology. And I have to joke about it so I don't cry sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you get new technology which allows you to communicate over lo long distances with people in a new way. You get new technology which allows you to archive and store and catalog and retrieve data in a new way. You get new technology that allows you to make records that are long-lasting and persistent over time. You get a new technology which introduces a division in society between those who use it and those who don't. And when you have this division in society with the new technology, then the question is, do those who don't use it become second-class citizens in the new world? And those who have it are the ones who have the money and the prestige. I'm not talking about the computer. <laughs> I'm talking about what Buddhism brought to Japan, writing. They brought writing. It was a new technology. It allowed for people to communicate over distance. It allowed people to make records. It allowed people to keep them, to archive them. And it also made an enormous distinction between people who could read and write and those who could not. The very advent of reading and writing that was brought by the Buddhists into Japan created illiteracy. You can't have real illiteracy unless you have somebody who's literate. It defined illiteracy for the first time, and it, it created an environment in which those who could read and write became those with a lot of power which other people did not have. Almost everything you hear about the computer industry today can be said exactly for what was occurring in Japan. Well, I've said before that this writing arrived from Korea into Japan as a kingly gift. I've been trying to decide what did this kingly gift and this technology look like? Can I find an example of what it must have looked like when they say Buddhist texts were sent from Pekshi to Japan? Recently, I came across an old manuscript in Korea which has given me a lot of hope that maybe I've found a pretty fair example of what it must have looked like. This is a manuscript which is in a private collection. Uh, the owner of it is nice enough to let me look at it, take a photograph of it. Uh, so it's uh, really interesting to study. Uh, some of you know I've been working on uh, the issue of forgeries of manuscripts for some time. So I'm a, I'm a cynic when it comes to somebody who says I've got an old manuscript and there's a part of me that says, mm-hmm, yep, let me see it. Uh, this one has defied all of my tests for a forgery. Uh, the brushwork is correct for old material. It's done with a hard brush. 
Uh, the ink is distributed in various uh, layers that show a hard brush delivers the ink onto the paper, not in total saturation, but with various degrees. Uh, it has also in it um, the situation of the way in which characters are written. That is one of the ways that we test for forgers is that forgers will make a mistake and make a character which we know to have been invented at a certain period of time. So anytime we see that character, we know that cannot be before 970 or 1020. <laughs> uh, in order to detect a forger, you have to know more than the forger, or you at least have to know something the forger didn't know, so you can trip them. <laughs> One of the ways we do it is what we call glyph construction. So I looked through this manuscript to see, at the top you will see the, the more modern ways of writing the characters, and at the bottom you'll see the ancient ways of writing them that I find in this manuscript. So once again, when I look at the glyph constructions, the manuscript holds true that it is filled with ancient forms, which would be very hard for a forger to have known because as you can see, there's a lot of difference between this top line and the bottom line. Uh, does this work? I don't think so. If you look at the top and you look at the bottom, you can see how I've taken pictures. Uh, oh, there's one. Oh, thank you. You can see here and here are, are this one and this one is an example of how it would be difficult. So I'm still looking at this manuscript thinking, okay, it's really old. And here you can see a little bit larger of how these characters differ from periods. So from the characters, I can say this is probably about an 8th century, at least an 8th century manuscript. It seems to hold true. What did it come in? It must have come in something like a sutra case. That is, we believe that there was a way to store these sacred texts, these scrolls, and it was a sutra case. So I've tried to find the oldest example I can of a sutra case. This is it. Unfortunately, this one only goes back to 1150. But Korea is a pretty conservative place, so I'm assuming that the king of Pekshe must have had a box inlaid somewhat like this, I suspect, in which he put a manuscript comparable to what I just showed you, and with this box and those manuscripts introduced to the Japanese the Buddhist written text as a kingly gift. And so this is the new technology, and this is the box it came in, I think. This is probably what was happening when we read those sentences, the king of Pekche sent the emperor of Japan or the court of Japan in Nara, sent them uh, Buddhist texts. The other thing that we look for is that immediately thereafter, the Japanese themselves began to, to do printing, and so, uh, or so it's called. These are examples of what we say is the oldest, oldest printing in the world. Um, there's one problem that I have with it, and it causes everybody lots of anguish to hear me say it, but it's not printing. <laughs> it's stamping. In other words, when you blow this up, these things that come out of the famous million stupas which the Empress created is not printing, uh, but was stamped. And so printing is reverse print, that is, where you have a, you have the put down the paper on a reverse thing and peel it off. That's true printing. So nevertheless, you could see that the Japanese themselves began to make use of this new technology, and they made use of it for religious purposes and for ritual purposes. And this is some of the earliest examples of what they did with it once they got the new technology. Um, I don't know that you can see this very well, but on my scroll, I found a picture of a pagoda. It's very faint, but there it is, a pagoda. So I started to explore that pagoda, and I looked at all of the various forms of pagodas in Korea that you see. 
Uh, they have different forms to, of ways, numbers of ledges that are put on each one, uh, the ways in which bells hang from the corners. And <clears throat> at the end of that, it is uh, obvious that the one I have on this one is a Pekshi dynasty one. So therefore, I also feel by looking at the picture on it that it must have been done by somebody who lived in the Pekshi region of Korea because that's the kind of pagoda he would have seen or she would have seen, whoever it is who drew that. So that the, the pagoda on the frontispiece of the manuscript allows me to at least give it a location. Since we believe that the first of this technology came from the Pekshi dynasty, I think with this scroll, I have something that's the closest we may ever come to seeing what the originals must have looked like from Pekshi. That this must be a Pekshi scroll of some type, and it, it, even though it's a later date than the ones that were sent to Japan, it may be as close as we will ever come to being able to see that. So you can see here, uh, the technology allows me to put these side by side, which is wonderful, uh, that I can take a, a diagram of, of a pagoda and then begin to study in detail the ways in which they are drawn. And so the thing that uh, you see over here is that's pretty subtle, but uh, it's this particular way in which this is constructed that tells us it is a Pekshi pagoda which is being shown to us. The other thing that came as kingly gift were images. And so I've asked myself the question, what were those images like that the Japanese first received from that Korean king? So we go to the Kudara, that is the oldest Japanese uh, images that we can date. And we see things like this. This is Maitreya. Uh, he is seated. He is the future Buddha. He is a young prince. He is a pensive young prince. He's already thinking about what the difficulties are going to be, maybe, and trying to be a Buddha in this world. It's not so easy. Uh, and, but here's what attracts me to this and what I think about. It's elegant. Isn't it elegant? There is an elegance to these early images, which I believe was part of the Pekshe type of art, that there was an elegance to it. I think that this is what Buddhism represented to Japan, that when it came to Japan, it brought to them a feeling that this religion is elegant. And it was that elegance which the court tried to represent when it inspired and paid for images such as these. Uh, in both cases, you can see that there is um, the line and the, the, the stream of it is, is this type of elegance. It's not trying to show power. They're not strong and they aren't overpowering and they are not large. But, but the real thing that must have been coming to the Japanese who were first getting Buddhism was that they were, that what appealed to them was this beautiful um, civilized image that they saw and that this represented true royalty to them, I think. The Pensive Prince shows up in many places. Uh, the Koreans built a whole tradition around it. I think that this, this is part of Turkic Buddhism. I think Maitreya was one that a figure who was more powerful in the Northwest than he ever was among the Han people. I think the Han people replaced him as soon as possible when the Sui reunified China. They replaced him with Amitabha Buddha and got rid of Maitreya. Maitreya is a little dangerous because, of course, he's going to come in the future and you don't know when that is. And it's much better to have a Buddha who's off in some far distant realm than one that might come and decide he wants to rule. The Japanese also imported from the Northern Way. Uh, the Northern Way were also Turkic peoples. And they began to get, these are images that began to come from farther and deeper into the Han territory. Quite beautiful and, and wonderful imagery began to come to them from these places as well. 
The other thing which the Buddhists brought to Japan, Jan, to the to the Japanese was architecture. And the architectural patterns which they brought, uh, they brought a new technology there as well. When I said they brought the technology of writing, along with writing, they brought the technology of paper, of brushes, of ink. Those were all technologies. At the same time in architecture, what they, and I've shown you metal, they brought a, an enormous information about metal, the construction of bells, the use of alloys, all of that was, was very important to them. I think architecture, though, that the technology that they brought was probably one of the great contributions that they made to the Japanese. Up to the time of the coming of Buddhism and the ways in which Buddhism dealt with things, Japanese really built log cabins. I mean, their architecture was quite simple. So if you look at some of the older buildings, they were fitted logs to be sure, but the one thing which they seemed to have lacked was they could not support a heavy roof. And not being able to support a heavy roof meant that their structures were also, it kept them simple. When, they came, when the Buddhists came, they brought with them the bracketed eaves. These are eaves which are built out with brackets, fitted brackets, and as you fit the brackets out, they are like my hands holding up like this, I hold up more and more weight. And then if you stand behind me with longer hands and hold up more, then before you know it, as you add one bracket after another, you can put enormous weight on one pillar. So the bracketed eave that they brought with them was to transform the way in which Japan constructed its buildings. And what it allowed them to do was, was quite remarkable. This is from Korea, but you can see how the bracketed eave goes inside the building. It's holding up this building. If you put uh, tiles on top of a building, it's very heavy. Um, some years ago, we built a house and, and we thought tile would be wonderful. And they said, you're kidding. Do you know how much tile weighs? <laughs> you can't do it if you live in earthquake country. Uh, but because of the weight of tiles and the fact that underneath tiles you have to put clay to, to make it waterproof, the weight that's on a roof like that is enormous. So this bracketed material that the Koreans had developed along with the Chinese allowed Japan to then move to a place where the court could produce now not so much, it's also elegant, but grandeur. That is, Buddhism allowed them to construct in a way that they had never been able to do before. This is Todaiji, this enormous structure that holds a gargantuan metal Buddha image. When you do this kind of construction, it means that the court now has power which it never had before, and part of that power was to display something so fantastic that it became a pilgrimage site to see it. People wanted to go to the court region to see what the new things they are, that they've built. This was, I suppose, like the Disney world of that time. I mean, everybody wanted to see it, so they flowed to Orlando or wherever. But when you look at it, you can understand that because this technology had been brought to the Japanese, and they made use of it, that what Buddhism brought was not only a spiritual tradition or its, its religious beliefs, but it brought with it technology which was to, to completely shift and change Japanese society, completely change the way they governed their nation. It was this shift in governance that I think was one of the big things for the Japanese. Japanese government had sent to Korea, a, a, I mentioned this last time, they sent this plated message and they said, uh, you've sent us case load after case load of sutras and you've sent us images, it's enough. Send us architects, send us engineers, send us calendar makers, send us technology, that's what we want. And so uh, when 
this began to appear, these, this technology was brought by, by monks. It was, these were trained monks. The monks had a tremendous advantage. They could read and write. Many of them were trained in engineering. They could do architectural uh, drawings. They could all help construct these, these buildings. So the Buddhists became uh, the technology people of that time. So what the Japanese government did was very smart in one way. They said, all right, we're going to have a monastery with beautiful, grandiose, grand buildings right here in the capital. And each of these monasteries will be given a place out there in the countryside to build a monastery that will report to them. And so the various monasteries in Nara began to build a string of related monasteries. As a result of that, Japanese Buddhism developed in a way which is absolutely unique in the Buddhist world. Each of those, I guess you would call them, uh, <coughs> and or these organizations of monasteries where there was a head monastery in the capital and then five, 10, 15 monasteries that belonged to that head monastery meant that Japanese Buddhism developed into a sectarian movement. You belong to one of those organizations, not to Buddhism in general. So you had to become a monk in a particular school of Buddhism. You had to become a member of the Hoso school, or you had to become a member of the Kagon school, whichever. But it was all based on this government-supported structure of having a central monastery with sub-monasteries scattered around in areas. The government also tried to scatter these monasteries in such a way that no one monastery had control over any one area. In other words, they mixed and matched. They played them against each other to some degree, I suppose. As a result of that, even today, Japan is the only place in the Buddhist world where if you ask somebody, particularly in East Asia, what kind of a Buddhist are you, they can tell you. They can say, I'm Jodo Shinshu, I'm Shingon, I'm Zen. Whichever school they belong to, they know. It's definite. My family goes to a Zen temple. That's where we do our burial practice. So therefore, I must be Zen, is usually the answer. If you go to China and you ask a Chinese monk or nun or some, are you a Chan Buddhist or are you a Huayan Buddhist or you can name all of these schools, they just look at you like you're dumb because they say, I'm a Buddhist. What, what's with this Chan Zen division? When people are ordained in Chinese Buddhism, the ordination is just one. Every Chinese monk and nun is ordained in exactly the same way. They are, can be ordained by any other monks and nuns. doesn't have to be certain school or certain people. But in Japan, it's very different. And this has a lot to do with the way in which we study Buddhism. Unfortunately, this has influenced our study of Buddhism because the Japanese are the best Buddhist studies people in the world. They have the, the largest group of people who study Buddhism. They have studied it from nonstop since it was introduced centuries ago. There are hundreds and hundreds of Buddhist specialists in Japan. They outnumber all the Buddhist specialists in the rest of the world. And they are good. They're well trained. However, none of them studies Japanese Buddhism. None of them studies anything which could be called Japanese Buddhism. So they look at us in the, in the West with great amazement because there are people here who are trained who say, yes, my specialty is Japanese Buddhism. I don't happen to be one of those, as you can tell from this lecture. But they say to those people, we don't know how you do it. It's too complicated. How could you study all of Japanese Buddhism? So I tell my classes sometimes it's really that there are Japanese Buddhisms 
not just Buddhism. It's plural. It's pluralistic. From, and so each scholar has to choose to study a school. So if you're a Pure Land scholar, you can't study Zen. Too complicated. You just study Pure Land. And if you want to study the history of your school, then what you do is you go to China and you try to find the roots of your school in Chinese Buddhism. And then you define Chinese Buddhism in terms of it being the root source for your Japanese sectarian tradition. And we follow them. You pick up any book on Chinese Buddhism and it will talk all about the schools of Chinese Buddhism. Chinese couldn't have cared less. They never paid any attention hardly to that. It was a very minor part of Chinese Buddhism. The things that were important to Chinese Buddhists were pan-Buddhist, the rituals, the desires for health and longevity, the ideas of enlightenment, the use of art. All of these things were pan-Chinese. Everybody did it. They didn't make such distinctions. You could understand why the Japanese scholars do it, however. It's very much comparable to what we do when we try to study the ancient world. We're trying to track back, for example, great interest in Christianity, for example, in the ancient world because it's a, it's a primary tradition of many people. Naturally, they're interested in seeing what part it played in that history. But the problem is that if you focus so much on that, you can sometimes really obscure other kinds of data. You may know that there's an enormous battle that's now going on about archaeology in the Holy Land. The big question is, have archaeologists been forced to make interpretations based on religious tradition rather than on the actual information which would be given to them, which may not always agree with a religious biblical account of the area, that there were other things going on at the same time. So do archaeologists on the West have to revisit it and say, maybe I have to look at this data all over again, and maybe I see a somewhat different picture? All of us in Buddhist studies need to go back and, and understand that we have been led by these wonderful Japanese scholars into the downside of their, their scholarship, which is sectarian. But this building I'm showing you here was the, the beginning of it. Um, a central monastery, grand and glorious, in the capital, with monasteries that were sub-monasteries of it, where all the monks and all the people out in those sub-monasteries said, yes, I know we've got this little monastery out here, but I belong to this big, glorious thing in the capital. That's mine. And I don't belong to the same one as the person next door who has a different lineage in terms of it. So it changed the way in which Buddhism was done in, in Japan. The architecture and the other things that came, however, allowed the Japanese to express their own creativity. And you will see things in Japan where they have used the technology of the eaves that I just described, but they use it in a way which nobody else has ever used it in. They have created sometimes this elegance that we see here, which you can hardly find any place else in the Buddhist world. In other words, their own creative drive when they took over this technology is what makes them distinct. And I think that's what we always need to remember when we look at how the Japanese did things. The other thing is to say, what are we looking at today when we look at a Japanese building? And I go back to Korea to, to show that the technology which came to them in architecture said, every building is fitted. There are no nails. You can take them all apart. You can repair them and put them back together exactly as they were before, except with new wood and, and new arrangements. So that means that the persistence of Japanese architecture is like the persistence of it in any place in Asia. What you're looking at is a copy. It's an exact copy. It's the same footprint. It's been dismantled, put back together many times. They will continue to do that. So that you, 
some people are now beginning to understand that if we really want to know the history of a particular place, what you have to do is to do dendrology. That is, you have got to look at the rings of the wood because since there are El Ninos that suddenly cause wood to grow one year and then there are droughts where the rings are very tiny, you can actually, of course, date from wood. And you can see that wood belongs to the same region of the world because it's got the same rings in it and you can actually date from this. It's a, it's a very exciting new technology that the computer has aided us to do. It's like a barcode. It's almost the same technology that's used in the grocery store for the barcode when you check out, except it's reading the barcode of tree rings to tell us where did this wood come from? What's the date of the wood? You can actually see when it was growing. I had a very, very interesting experience just a couple of weeks ago. I took a Japanese friend of mine over to Muir Woods and we were looking at this log. They have sod where it says, you know, Columbus and goes back to 970. And on all the things that were put on there had to do with Western world. And I loved it because he looked at it and he said, I see it started growing in the Tang Dynasty. <laughs> That's, this is to say that it's, we have to always keep in mind that, that we project off our own views onto these things and that it's this attempt to try to understand when we do that, we can't help it and it's all right to do it and sometimes it's valuable, we just need to know that we're doing it. <laughs> so, when the Japanese themselves began to pick up and started to make things, uh, there was a there was uh, the strong influence that Buddhism had. This is Guanyin. This is a very early Japanese Guanyin. Uh, and you can see that there's, there is a development here of people trying to understand who this personage is, what she's about, or he. Uh, we assume in this case it's, it, it's, he's still masculine because uh, he's barred, uh, bared in the, in, the, in the shoulders. So we also see that he's got very special features. You'll notice that his arm goes down to his knees. <laughs> and that's one of the marks of a super <coughs> person. Um, very ancient Indian markings that say People who are special have long earlobes. They have hair that curls to the right on top of their head. They have arms that go down to their knees. They have swastikas on the soles of their feet. Their nails are copper colored. They glow golden, etc. We've never understood those marks to be truthful, but um, there it is. Uh, they look to us weird and up and just strange. They're never seen except by those who are, who are more enlightened, who can see them. This one is an 11-headed Guanyin, and I'm interested that they were, oops, wrong one, that they were already doing 11-headed Guanyins in those days. I think I've told you the story of when I, <coughs> that there's a 15-headed Guanyin in Singapore, because they took a picture of an 11-headed Guanyin, sent it to Italy to have a statue carved. The person in Italy looked at the picture and thought that the heads go all the way around, so instead of counting 11, he figured there must be four more to make the complete circle in the back, so he made 15. I just warn the, you who are art historians, don't you will understand that how the 15-headed Avalokiteshvara got started from Singapore. Came from Italy. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we see about this one, I think, is that the, the thing which impressed, must have impressed the Japanese a lot was the fact that these deities had such power and that they could do s multiple things. I've come to believe that one of the great contributions of Buddhism to the idea of deity in Japan was the multiplicity of action that could occur with one deity. 
in many cultures you have a particular deity for a certain thing. If you want good luck, you go to one shrine. If you want a male birth, you go to another. If you want to uh, have a, um, if you want to do black magic, you go to something else. You know, you, each, each shrine has its specialty, and deities have their specialty. When Guan Yin came along, here they had suddenly the idea, hey, you don't really need all these specialists. You can still have a general practitioner that you can go to who will be able to tell you and deal with anything that you've got, you know. It's like, I'm sure that uh, maybe someday we'll have a Guan Yin back in the medical profession, but we're struggling to, to see how they looked at these individuals. And I think that part of it was this absolute difference it made to people to say, but here's somebody who can do so much. That in itself was a way of conversion to Buddhism. Buddhism would say, yeah, you've got all of your gods, it's fine, keep them. Buddhists never ask people to give up their deities. It's fine, they're good. Yes, put them in the, even put them in the monasteries if you want. Make them into Buddhist defenders, they'll help. But here was the special creature. The other thing that we see in it is that not only was this a powerful deity, but was the, the deity was compassionate. Not everybody's gods are compassionate. The Greeks, unfortunately for them, never had a compassionate god that I've ever seen. I mean, their gods were wretches. They didn't do anything but cause the Greeks troubles. You know, they'd come down and rape and pillage and, and cause a lot of trouble, and then they'd go back up to Olympus and wait to come down and play another day. And so uh, you just, you weren't sure what these gods are going to do to you. I was telling Marianne about, I was recently in Korea, and I was in gridlock traffic watching the time slip away, knowing I was not going to make my appointment with the university president after all, because I'm sitting here. So I said to my young friend who's driving, well, how long do you think it's going to take us? So he's an Indian scholar, so he used the old Indian expression, Ishvara Leela, which means the play of Ishvara the Creator. Who knows what Ishvara's got in store for us today? <laughs> We haven't any idea what the play is for today. It's going to be they're playing with us. This, however, is the other aspect of a deity, which is compassion. Because for Avalokiteshvara or for Guan Yin, it was that the purpose of the deity is to help regardless of what the need is or regardless of the state of the person who asked for the help. In this case, it's very much like uh, Mary in Christianity. It's not dependent upon doing something. It's not dependent upon being worthy. It's not dependent upon having given lots of gifts. None of that. Compassion is given with, without regard to any of that. So compassion and multiplicity of powers made this something which they were willing to put a lot of effort into and were much attracted to it. So when we see the role which art began to play in Japan, uh, it was magnificent. It is magnificent. There is, there is this wonderful magnificence about it because I think from the very beginning, the Japanese had the, an idea that the world of the Buddha is this incredible situation. The sutras tell you that. They say, one day the Buddha was teaching, he was surrounded by tens of thousands of beings. Bodhisattvas and Mahasattvas stretched to the horizon. In the sky were millions of deities. Some were singing, others were raining down flowers which floated down on this scene. This to the Japanese was, I think, something which told them that in order to really depict Buddhism, you have to depict this magnificent scene. The altar must be magnificent. 
It really must be. The, f the flowers which descend from the heaven really must be. I don't know if you've ever been in a Japanese ceremony where they, where they have flowers descending. It's a wonderful ceremony. You get little handfuls of um, paper disc, brightly colored paper disc, which you throw into the air. And everybody in the room has them, and they all throw them into the air at once. And then the whole room is filled with this incredible experience of watching the four colors floating down with these wafers of, of paper and color. These, this is an attempt to mimic that moment when the flowers descended on the Buddha who is teaching. So at the same time that I've talked about all this technology, you have to understand that this is something which was appealing very deeply and emotionally to a Japanese culture in which they saw Buddhism as, as not only elegant, they saw it as, as powerful, enormously powerful. It carried with it technology, but it also carried all of these incredible deities which they wanted to represent, and they felt the need to represent them, I think, as, as in as elegant a form as they could. They wanted to show the light shining from their heads. They wanted to show halos. They wanted to show that they were golden colored and that they glowed. They, this was for them not just making something pretty. It was not done for that. It was to represent the realistic view of what a deity is like. This is what they're like. I have a friend who's Sri Lankan and he said, that his mother is a very devout Buddhist in Sri Lanka. And he said, my mother has always believed that the Buddha is seven palm trees high. And if I say to her about mother, he was a person, he lived on this earth, he was the same size as everybody else, she just turns her back and won't talk to me for the rest of the day. <laughs> That's her Buddha. That's what he looks like. I feel that, that this is for the Japanese, what we're seeing, this is what these people, this is what they really look like. They are this gorgeous. They are this magnificent. They are this supernatural being, so that part of what they wanted to display was this. <clears throat> Very different than the Shinto tradition. Shinto tradition where you have no imagery. Shinto tradition where you have no way and no attempt nor even an interest or even a feeling that it should happen that you depict a body for the, for the kami. The kami has no body, really. The presence is there, it's, but, and it's wonderful too. But you can understand the appeal of this iconic uh, patterns. And then I think the Japanese came around to say, we want to protect them. How do we protect such powerful creatures? And they, the, the protectors which they picked are, I think, the most wonderful protectors that any Buddhist could have. They are the wrestlers. They are really fierce. If I ever had a protector, I think this is what I'd want for my, my bodyguard, right? You would be able to walk anywhere in town, anywhere, night or day, with somebody like this behind you. It's, it's very true. So. I look at the protectors to say how much it meant to them. These protectors tell me these people really wanted to protect this. <laughs> they were willing to give all the strength and power and muscles and, and, uh, to, to their protectors. And it was uh, the realism of it was to say this, we are putting up there a kind of uh, proxy for ourselves to protect and to, and to keep them. And then, uh, before we take a break, just one last thing. I think the other thing which was introduced to the Japanese was portrait sculpture. And even at an early period, they began to make portrait sculptures of individuals. I believe that the portrait sculpture is the great contribution of the Greco-Roman world to Buddhism. I think it's the portrait sculpture which has really helped to form the Buddhist image. 
And I think that the idea of a portrait sculpture was already being introduced. This is not a painting, it's not on a flat surface, it is a three-dimensional portrait sculpture. That's, that, was a, a, that was a new idea and a way to bring, bring it forth. And I think the fact that even in the earliest period at Nara, we find a portrait sculpture is of significant importance. So I'm, I'm got, I'll do something else for the next hour, but I wanted to do in this first is to, to give you some feeling for the fact that when Buddhism comes to Japan, it's this great mixture. It's technology, it's cultural patterns, it's new ways of doing things, it's, it's all of that. And at the same time, it is a new kind of spirituality. It opens up new doors for the Japanese and it's their creative genius which took all of that and made out of it what we know of today as, as Japanese Buddhism. Okay, so let's take a break. that I have up here is I'd like to show you something which didn't happen to Japan, which was very important. This is part of our cultural atlas again, little thing. This is time map. Uh, you can see the time is going by and you see this great circle up here, which is the Mongols. And the Mongols, uh, you can see we've reached 1167, 1171, was this small little group uh, of a steppe nomadic kingdom. And then, uh, as time goes by, they begin to uh, spread. Um, as they spread, and by the way, this is... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> This is all being created by uh, just words and figures that are underneath this. Very tedious to put it together. Where were the Mongols? Where was their latitude and longitude at a certain date? And so uh, by doing that, we're able to present this in a way which uh, I'm trying to, to uh, deal with. And I think for those of you here who work with docent training and other things, you know, they tell us that our brain is, 37% uh, of the brain is wired for visuals. We really have a brain that is set up to handle visual material. And I think that, uh, as you can see, the Mongols fade away. <laughs> it's this, uh, I'll go back to this, go back to my other one just here in a minute. <laughs> Yes, we do. Um, okay, the website is uh, www.ias.berkeley spelled out dot edu backslash ECAI which stands for Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative. You can keep up with us a little bit on that. It's, uh, as they say, not case sensitive. <laughs> you can use CAPS or R, either one. The reason I showed you that, though, was to to point out one thing. Everything that you saw there showed how far the Mongols spread. The Mongols, in my view, created our modern world. It was the Mongols that finally taught us that this is a global place. It was the Mongols who allowed 
Marco Polo to go from the Mediterranean basin to China and back. It's that going back which is really crucial. That is, we don't know who wanders out and how far they went. If they don't come back, we'll never know. But he came back. And he, maybe he brought pasta, we don't know, but. <clears throat> it touched everywhere but Japan. If you notice in that animation, the Mongols never got to Japan. And so the great influence and the, the opening up of the world, which they spread across the Eurasian landmass, uh, Japan stayed out of it. And of course, you know the famous uh, typhoons twice that arose, and some people feel three times to wipe out the Mongol invading forces, that those winds that became called kamikaze. Well, when you look at how what the Mongols accomplished, you can understand that that a whole Japanese feeling of to be spared this invasion by a group that goes all the way to Poland and who are start out just next door is remarkable, isn't it? It really is remarkable that it happened that way. It left Japan, uh, in a sense, to develop in its own ways without some of the impact with the, which the Mongols made. The Mongols made enormous impact on lots of people. In some cases, they didn't stay long enough to do it, but they left behind the Tartars in Russia, and they, they left behind uh, enormous changes in China with the, with the Yuan Dynasty. They opened up Tibet and Mongolia in ways that they had never been opened up before. They brought to the fore Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan forms of Buddhism. They changed art, they changed clothing, they changed dress. They had enormous influences. Japan missed it to a degree. And so when we go back and look at, at Japan, we have to keep that in mind that the, the later developments of Japanese Buddhism will be ones in which we do not have this Mongol influence and this disruption of its cultural patterns.